just for those of you who have been around for a while, um, Lexa Zober passed away this week after a long battle with cancer, so uh, service is undated right now. <laughs> but we will let you know. It's probably going to be, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from Pat, probably it will be after Easter. So, um, But yet we will keep you updated on those developments and remember Lexa and her children and the Bishop family clan as they prepare for saying goodbye to Lexa. We've been going through Lamentations, and Lamentations is a bit of a, a times depressing book. <laughs> um, but it's also an important book in a lot of ways. A few, I want to say 100 years ago, there was a practice or a, or a pursuit in science that was after the ability to turn one thing into something else. It's called alchemy. And it's surprising how many really smart people were involved in trying to figure out the process. The, the holy grail, the, you know, the, what everybody wanted was to turn lead into gold. So lead is a base metal and gold is a precious, noble metal. And that was the hope. Somehow we were, they were going to dip lead into a solution and it would rearrange itself so it became actually gold. And that hasn't actually paid off, but um, but we spent time and money doing it anyways. This is the symbol, the alchemy symbol for, for lead. And uh, there's lead and gold beside each other. And of course, we at the time, we really didn't know what lead was or what gold was. You're not quite sure of like the atomic, we hadn't gotten that deep yet. But we knew it was something that the gods could do. This really started with the Greeks and, and alchemy was, was something that the gods did. And so the Greeks believed that if the gods could do it, then we should be able to learn to do it too. And so they started off this practice, which then spread to, to different cultures, different times. You know, Isaac Newton was a phenomenally smart person, and yet he's written about a thousand pages on alchemy as he's trying to figure out what this process might be. But as I said, it was, it was part of what the gods did, and, and, and even in our Bible, you will find this process of alchemy usually used in the hands of God. It's in the creation story. I mean, think about it. God took water and made it into fish. He took air, made it into birds. He took dust and made it into cows and lions and jackals. And yeah, at the very end of the process, he made it into us. He turned one thing to something else. And we wanted to know what that process was. And as we continue to read through the Bible, we find out that there is more transmutation going on within, within the biblical pages. If you are a, a scientific person, if you lean and you understand what science is, sometimes some of the most frustrating passages to read can be in the Old Testament where oh, the story of Jacob, he's, he's with his father-in-law and he wants to go home and his father-in-law says, why don't you stay? Says, you, you know, you, you tell us what the wages are. I will, I will go along with whatever you say, but please stay here with us. And so Jacob decides he's going to take what he says is, you know, spotted lambs multi-colored, streaked lambs, and the flock would be his. And so his father-in-law agrees, and they separate the flock into these you know, pure colors, and the ones that are spotted, the spotted ones belong to, 
to Jacob. And then Jacob figures out how to make spotted lambs. Here's the story. And, you know, suspend your um, disbelief for a second. You probably read this, but Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almond, and plane trees and made white strips on them by peeling the bark and exposing the inner white wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in, in all the watering troughs so that they would be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat, were in heat they came to drink, and may, they made it in front of the branches, and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. And Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, but made the rest face the streak and dark animal, colored animals that belonged to Laban. He made separate flocks himself, but did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place branches in the troughs in front of the animals so that they would mate near the branches. But when the animals were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. So that's what you have to do, right? You take a branch and you cut it, so you cut the bark off it, so that it is streaked. And then you place that branch inside the water trough so that when the animals come and drink the water, they will be streaked. And when they conceive of new life, because it's done in front of these branches, they will be streaked. Like, that's the way it works, isn't it? I mean, we read this passage and we're going, what? That doesn't work. Well, obviously it did. According to the story, it worked fine. But it's more alchemy than anything else. It's, it, it, it's a, it, some, something else is going on. It's, it's not Jacob being smart. It's God going along with him. Because this shouldn't have worked. But it did. So we have chased after alchemy for a long time. The reason why I'm, I'm talking about it is because we have alchemy, actually, in the f first verses of Lamentations 4. Now, just a warning here. Lamentations 4 can be violent and sad and depressing. So I'm going to read four and a half verses this morning, and that's it. You can go read the whole thing this afternoon if you want, but I'm just going to read four and a half verses of Lamentations 4 just so that we can get kind of the high points of the, of, of the Lamentation written by Jeremiah. So here it is, Lamentations 4. We're going to start off. How the gold has lost its luster. The fine gold, gold became dull. The sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. How precious the children of Zion, once worth their weight in gold are now considered as pots of clay and the work of the potter's hand. That first blank, if you're trying to keep them, is um, our core value. Now, already we have some problems with Lamentations 4. Um, part of it is the way that it's written. It says that we were fine gold, but that we have lost our luster. We have become tarnished. My grandfather, back in the day, was a coin collector. Um, so he got me kind of into collecting coins. But there was a problem that happened in 1968 that did not please my grandfather. Um, in 1968, the Canadian Mint went, meant, went from putting real silver in his coins to just baser metals. So his, my, my, my grandfather's coin collection was stolen when I was still quite young. But by this time, he had kind of lost faith in coin collecting anyways because these weaker metals were being used to make all of our coins after 1968. So you had to have coins minted before then if you were going to have anything that was really worth anything. And so here's, here's, here's an example. These are two coins that my grandfather gave to me. 
They have been in my possession since 1963 and 1968. Um, the 1960s, neither one have ever been used, by the way. These, never, these have never bought anything. They're both rated as about uncirculated, is the rating that, that is given to them. Um, but you'll notice that the 1963 coin isn't as bright and shiny as the 1968 coin. And the problem is, is that the 1963 coin actually has silver in it. And the silver is becoming dull and tarnished because that's what happens to silver. The 1968 coin doesn't have any of that, so it's still, it still looks pretty much like the day it was minted. Because of the lack of silver, the, the, the 1963 coin is worth about $30 more than the 1968 coin because there's actually silver in it. But metals can tarnish. They can grow dull. Here's the problem. Do you know what does not tarnish? Pure gold. Gold doesn't tarnish. Gold doesn't really lose its luster. Not pure gold. And yet, Jeremiah begins lamentations by saying, oh, here, you, are, you were fine gold, but you are becoming tarnished. You are becoming something that is less. And, and the only way that could happen is if through us being pure gold and our living, if we started to pick up impurities within who we are. So Jeremiah is actually making a huge statement here. He's saying, you were made of fine gold. That's the way God has produced you. But, but you've been picking up things that have made you impure. You're, you're not the pure person that you were when God created you. You have picked up impurities, and because of those impurities, you are getting dull. You are becoming tarnished. You're losing your core value. But then he makes another really wild statement. Let me go back to it here. How the precious children of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as pots of clay, the work of the potter's hand. It's not just that you're becoming tarnished, but there's been some transmutation here. You have gone from being gold, a precious metal, to clay, a fine-grained earth dust that has been used to make common pottery for centuries, millennia. Once you were gold, but now, you are clay. And that might sound like a big demotion, but it's not. Listen to something that Jeremiah wrote about 20 years before he wrote this Lamentation 4. Here it is. This is the word that came down to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you a message. So I went down to the potter's house and saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands, and so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it as seemed best to him. Then the Lord, then the word of the Lord came to me and said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. story that Jeremiah is telling in Lamentations is once you, were, once you were gold, I created you pure and worth something. But as you live life, impurities gathered. The metal became tarnished. It lost its luster. And I made you into clay. And I have taken the clay that I have changed your gold into, and I have molded it with my hands. 
I have shaped it as I saw fit. I did this because you are important to me. Once we were like a precious metal, but sin has inflicted its impurities on us. And what we once were, we aren't any longer. We are clay, but we are still in the Father's hands. In our grief, he is molding us, shaping us. Our grief will help us to move into the future. So don't mourn about what you once were and rest in the potter's hands. This is what we need as, as people to understand. Grief is universal. We all go through it. But God can and does mold us, even, even in our grief, even in those moments where we feel like our hearts are being torn out of our bodies and there's nothing left. Even then, God can mold us and make us into who he needs us to be. I'm going to skip over to verse 14. Now, they grope through the streets as if they were blind. They are so defiled with blood that no one dares to touch their garments. Go away, you are unclean, people cry to them. Away, away, don't touch us. And when they flee and wander about, people among the nations say, they can stay here no longer. And again, the blank is the other side of, of blood. We are struggling as a Christian community with the things that are happening in other parts of the world, and I get it. And we've had some discussions. I've had discussions with some people about why God would allow what's happening in, in Israel and Gaza or in Ukraine with Russia. Why would God allow such things? And my response is always, well, it's not that God allows us, but we have been given the ability to choose, and unfortunately, we often make choices we shouldn't make. But as the conflict in Israel has continued, I have to admit I have gone back and I've started to look at both sides of the, of the conflict. Early on, it became very aware, very apparent that we seem to naturally pick sides. And so I've seen people with Palestinian flags driving around Edmonton. I've talked with some of you as you've been probably, probably more Team Israel, hoping that, some, that Israel would do something. But here's the problem. And it's sometimes a problem that we don't quite understand. We know the story of is the backstory of Israel. We know Israel ceased to be a nation in about 70 CE. Um, it was with the Roman Empire, and they came in and flattened the city. And Israel became nothing. It just simply didn't exist. And so there is about not quite 1,900 years of history that has been between the defeat of Israel in 70 and the reinstatement in 1948. And for the most part, the Jews have lived as visitors in other nations. They have lived because they did not have a nation of their own with other people. And there are very strong anti-Jewish sediments that have been a problem probably ever since 70. But these problems came to a head in the Second World War when Hitler decided to gather up all of these Jews and put them in concentration camps and execute them on scary numbers. 
And so when World War II ended, there was, there was a belief among the civilized nations that Israel needed a place that could be theirs. And the place that, in our wisdom, the place that Israel wanted and we decided to give them was their traditional homeland where King David reigned and all of the kings of Judah and Israel. They didn't get the full extent of it, but they got a piece of land on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. They became, they, they, they declared their independence with the blessing of the West, Western nations on May 14th, 1948. On May 15th, 1948, they fought in their first war, which lasted for the next 10 months because the Arabs in the area didn't want them there. And so there was a war to try to kick them out, and the Arabs thought they would be able to do that quite easily, but that proved not to be true. See, the problem was Israel had no place else to go. And so it wasn't an army that they fought one day after they declared their, their independence. It was just normal people trying to defend their homes from people who didn't want them there. They had gone through the Holocaust, all the horrors that that involved, and now they just wanted a home and they were willing to fight for it. Israel won their homeland, won back some land that they weren't given in the first place. And there has been conflict ever since then, really, between Israel and the rest of the Middle East. But Israel's got no place to go. This is home. There's no other nation where they can go and say, this is ours, this belongs to us. It's only that little strip of land there on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. You know that story, probably. What we don't know is the story from the other side. First mention of Palestine occurred about the 12th century BCE in Egypt. That's about 100 years before Samson. So Palestine existed in, in antiquity. We find the first mention, as I said, at 12 BCE in Egypt, that, about Palestine and the Palestinian people. And essentially, they have occupied the same track of land as Israel. And this is their home. And this is a bit of an overstatement, but whenever... Israel wasn't there, Palestine was. So since the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, the Palestinians have grown and set up their homes in that area. In fact, Israel was 60% Arab Muslim in 1945 at the end of World War II. And they share something with Israel. They have no other place to go. It was a bit of a mystery to some of us when, we, when, the, when the war in Gaza started that Egypt wouldn't let the Palestinians into their nation. We're saying, well, if they would just open up the gates, if they would just let the Palestinians come through, that they would be safe in Egypt. But... The Arab nations will not allow Palestinians to come into their, into their nations. Why? Because they believe in an Arab Israel. And they're afraid that if the Palestinians come and live in their nations, that they will not leave. And so they close their gates towards Palestinians. So you have two nations. Both of them coexisting on the same land, both of them have, have had it drilled into them that this is their 
area. This is their land. There's nowhere else for them to go. And so they fight accordingly. What we need is a solution that would allow us to satisfy both of these nations. But there really isn't one, other than the two-stage or the two-nation state that has been suggested by the UN and several other people. Why am I talking about this? It just seemed to be so obvious. When they f go away, you are unclean, people cry to them. Away, away, don't touch us. When they, when they flee and wander about, people among the nations say they cannot, they can stay here no longer. As I read that passage in Lamentations, I, thought, I could have thought that was written right now about what's happening in Israel. They can stay here no longer. Both sides want the other side out. And somehow we've got to come to peace in the midst of this, of this terrible war. The other side of blood. Lamentations, Jeremiah is, is describing these people who are running and they have no place to go and they have blood pouring out of them and they are unclean and they cannot be touched. And Jeremiah doesn't know what to do. He, so he cries out to God, God, how, how do we deal with this? How, how does this happen? And there's no voice that comes back to him and tells him what the answer is except that I will love you and I will mold you. I will bring you to the potter's wheel and I will or the potter's wheel and I will reform you. But you have to be willing to come to me. I also found that the blood in this passage in this long passage of, of lament, also seemed to point to someone else who was rejected, who had come to this point of death, and nobody wanted to touch him. He was cursed. The Bible says he was cursed for us. He died on our behalf. The blood that poured out of him made us clean. Can you just... Just pause for a second. Can you get that image into your head? Blood that poured out of Jesus makes us clean. Has that ever happened to you? You've cut your hand and blood starts pouring out and you felt that it made you clean? No. And yet there is a transmutation happening here where God says, listen, the blood will make you clean. The blood of Jesus who we rejected, the blood of Jesus who we kicked out of our presence, his blood poured out on his people will make them clean. It doesn't make sense. I get it. But it's what God says. And the question that is on our hearts is, are we willing to walk through that door? Are we willing to take that step? Okay, I just want to read half of, or half of another verse here. Your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. Even in the midst of grief, God loves you. Loves you enough to change you into clay and remold you. Loves you enough to make you clean even in the presence of blood. Loves you enough to say that your exile will end. It's over. Done. Loves you enough 
to keep you with him. I admitted a few weeks ago that I really loved Tony Campolo stories. And in our Sunday school class this morning, there was just three of us, so we, we kind of sat around and asked questions and told stories. And one of the Sunday school members asked about a, a story that I had told a long time ago, and I said, yeah, that's a, a Tony Campolo story. I won't tell you that story this morning. I've got another one that I need to tell you. Tony Campolo says that uh, everybody should, should counsel at a, at a junior high boys camp at some point in their life. I agree. Everybody should, should counsel at a junior high boys camp at some point in their life. He says you, 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 you find out that there are things that, you know, are bad in life. In fact, he says, you know, if, when, when God you know, takes me up there and tells me I have to spend, spend time in purgity. Uh, purger, ah, pur, yes, you got it. <laughs> Purgatory. I am going to tell him I've already been there. I've counseled the junior, junior high boys. Junior high boys have, have a way of, of getting this pack mentality and then picking on somebody who isn't quite like and so Tony remembers a junior high camp that he counseled at where that was precisely what happened. He said there's a 13-year-old kid, and his name was Billy. And he said Billy was at this camp, and Billy was, was different. And if you're in junior high, the worst thing that you can be is different. So Billy was different, and, and part of the problem was is that he didn't walk like normal kids walked. He seemed to have to hop. You know, he had to get himself up and, and put the leg out and then come down and get himself up and put the leg out and then come down. So he kind of this, this kind of a hopping, st stuttered walk that you could tell that it was Billy from a long place, a long ways away crossing a field. He was the only one that walked like that. The other thing with Billy was that he really couldn't talk. Uh, he had this halting way of, of talking, and the kids picked up on that quite quickly and started to make fun of him and tease him for the way he walked and the way he talked. Tony says he was walking by a group of kids. He said Billy was coming up to them, and he heard Billy ask a question. Which way to the craft shop? And he said, one of the boys turned to him and said, it's that way, Billy boy. And Billy walked off to the craft shop. He said the week progressed. Uh, Tony did what he could to try to help Billy fit in, but nothing seemed to work. But he said the worst day was Thursday. He said, unbeknownst to him, Thursday was the day that Billy's cabin was supposed to give the morning devotional when all the camp gathered. And Billy's cabin had unanimously chosen Billy to give the devotional. He's, Tony says by the time he... he, he figured that out, uh, it was too late. He couldn't change it. So the time came for the devotional, and, and Tony says he was just fuming, angry. And he watched as Billy got up and walked in his halting walk towards the front and the rostrum that was standing there. He said, Billy got behind that rostrum, and he looked at his peers, all of them expecting to make fun of him. And Billy gave his devotional, which was as follows. Jesus loves me, and I love Jesus. Tony says it took him about 30 seconds to get the words out. And then Billy was done. And he started to go back to his seat. 
And Tony took a look at the guys that had gathered, expecting to make fun of them, and was amazed to find that they were all crying. He said, we had brought in sports stars. We had brought in celebrities to talk to the kids about Jesus Christ. And nothing had worked until this child made his way to the front of the room and gave his testimony of loving Jesus in front of his peers. Tony says a revival broke out. The rest of the week was different. It had been changed. All because of Billy. Tony travels around a lot. And he says, I often come up with people who will come up to speak to me after a, a sermon or a, a teaching time that I've given. And they'll say, you know what? You probably don't remember me. But I became a Christian at a junior high camp where you counseled. And do you know what it was that did it for me? And Tony says, I don't need them to say anything further. I know the next word that's coming out of their mouth. It's Billy. What an amazing way that God can use even us. Jeremiah is writing his laments after the destruction of Jerusalem. The best and the brightest have been taken to Babylon in three different exiles. They're all gone. The leaders of the nations, the kings, his cabinet, none of them are left. They've all gone to Babylon. Those in Judah who are the next rung, the middle class, the ones who have some power to do something, they have left and gone to Egypt. In fact, Jeremiah would be kidnapped by this group of people and would be forced to go to Egypt with them. And Jeremiah would die in Egypt. Essentially, all that's left in Judah is the billies of Judah. They're not the best and the brightest. They're gone to Babylon. They're not the ones who have the ability to pick up and leave because they picked up and left. They're the poor, the economically deprived, the handicapped, the ones who have no choice. They have to stay because there is no way for them to go anywhere. And yet, Jeremiah writes to them, your punishment will end. He will not prolong your exile. Israel, for you who are in Babylon, for you who are the best and the brightest and have been stolen from your nation. Your God loves you. For those who have disobeyed me, the ones who have some resources, although not much, but you have enough that you've been able to pick up and go to Egypt, where I told you not to go. I love you. For those who have stayed in Judah, not because 
of some phenomenal commitment that you've made, but just because you have no other choices. I love you. And this isn't going to last forever. You are worth saving. You're worth it. Hear my voice this morning. Not Jeremiah speaking to his nation, but me speaking to you. You're worth it. You are special. In the midst of your grief, God loves you. Obviously, I have been thinking a lot the last couple of days about Lexa, trying to figure out what I'm going to say if I'm given a chance at her funeral. So you might hear this again. I had a friend, a good friend, years ago. She's gone on now. Who used to have a saying that everybody hated. But she said it anyway. She didn't really care. And she'd tell people who were a little vulnerable to get their big girl panties on because there's things to be done. Alexa and I had many conversations. We talked about some foolish things. She disagreed with me on the version of the Bible that I use. We disagreed on many other things as well. And we would have discussions. And if you've ever talked to Alexa, you probably have had some of those discussions too. But I never doubted that Alexa loved me, even in the midst of disagreements. It didn't matter. This was the way that she loved. And that's okay. Sometimes we have to understand that love is expressed in many ways. Maybe it's hard to get our head around why a loving God would allow what's happening right now to happen. Why a loving God would allow Israel to be taken away or driven out of their land 2,500 years ago during the days of Jeremiah. But it's time to get your big girl panties on because he loves you. And while you may not understand the whys, he does. And he will bring us through our times of grief and mourning because we are important to him. You have been formed with the hands of the potter. You have been made the way that he wants to make you. He continues to have his hand on you and on your life. And he loves you. The presence of mourning in our life is never proof of absence of God. But just times when sometimes we don't feel him working with us and molding our clay the way that he feels he needs to mold it. And sometimes we just need to remind ourselves, God, 
thank you for making me the way that you have. Thank you for loving me enough to allow me to go through challenges and times of grief and mourning with you. Knowing that you have promised to bring me out on the other side. Lent is a time of mourning and grief, but we cheat. And I'm not talking about Sundays. We cheat because we know how long it's going to last. Real grief and mourning, it will end. We don't know when. And there will be days when that grief becomes real on us once again. And God's words of comfort are no less valuable then than they were when he first spoke them. I am with you. I love you. Your time of grief has an expiry date. There will be a day when you will get through it. All you have to do is commit to walk with me. And I will place you. I will carry you. I will take you where you need to be. Trust me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We all know grief. Right now with the passing of Lexa, God, we are, we are hurting. But we know that you are with us. We agree with, with David as he wrote, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You lead us to the table that you have set for us so that we can eat with you. God, for each person who right now is just in mourning, I pray that you would be a comfort to them, that you would remind them of what Jeremiah tells us. Even in the midst of these bad moments, you love us. Our grief, our self-imposed exile will end. And there will be a day when we will, will, will be able to see you as you should be seen. But for now, it is through clouds and mirrors. So come. Come, Holy Spirit, into our lives, into our hearts. Come and love us the way that we know we need to be loved. Carry us when we, when we need to be carried. Remind us of the future that you have planned with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's the Lord of my soul. Oh, my soul.